How do molecules store energy? Is it really stored in the bonds? Why are some people confused about it and why should we care? Keep watching to find out. Even non-chemists instinctively know that some molecules contain more energy than others. We fuel cars with petrol and not water. We eat carbohydrates but not chalk. So how did we work this out? With food, since the earliest emergence of animals, we used a process of trial and error to find which combinations of chemicals allowed us to move around more after eating them. These days, we know that eating lots of pasta is necessary before running a marathon, whereas a diet of only celery will leave you unable to move within a couple of weeks. Then, with the discovery of fire making, we identified chemicals that consistently released heat in their reactions. Wood, coal and animal fat were firm favourites. And finally, with the discovery stroke invention of thermodynamics, we learned that chemicals that do work, for example, expanding gases or generating electrical current, is another sign that a chemical contains movement stuff. Rock oil, which had previously been a relatively useless commodity, then became a global necessity because with it, we can make things move. These days, chemists use a piece of equipment called a calorimeter to directly measure how much energy these fuels and foods contain. For example, it's measurements with calorimeters that tell you how many calories are in your packet of food. But what is it? That means some chemicals contain lots of energy and others don't. How do molecules store energy? Is it stored in the bonds, like the textbooks say? Well, Derek Muller of YouTube channel Veritasium emphatically said that it isn't. He said that atoms lose energy by making bonds and therefore the energy of a molecule is not stored there. Nick Lucid from the Science Asylum channel followed this up by saying that things are a bit more complicated, but basically said the energy is stored in the molecule as a whole and not in the bonds of the molecule. So who's right? Have the chemists been wrong all this time? To answer these questions, we first have to understand what energy is, what a bond is and what an abstract concept is. So, no big deal. If you've already watched my video on activation energy, I'm going to explain energy so you can just skip straight to 5 minutes 12 seconds if you want to. To get a bit of pedantry out of the way, I'm specifically talking about how the chemical energy of a molecule relates to its electrons. There are more complete explanations for talking about materials on the macro scale, but that's a video for another day. Now, if we're focusing on a single molecule hanging around in space, all of its chemical energy comes from its valence electrons, the electrons in the outside layers that control chemical bonding. Very simply, the negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged nuclei and are repelled by each other. When we separate the electrons from the nuclei, they have the potential to move back together. And that movement is kinetic energy. So we can use some kinetic energy to separate them and then they have the potential to get that same amount of kinetic energy back when they move back together. Or put even more simply, separating the electrons from the nucleus gives them the potential to have kinetic energy. And even more simply, separating the opposite charges gives them potential energy. But if the electrons are attracted to the nuclei, why don't they just stick to the nuclei and stay there? Well, that's because of quantum mechanics. That basically says the electrons can only occupy certain volumes of space called orbitals and no more than two electrons at a time can be in any one orbital. That's a simplification, but it'll do for this video. 
Quantum mechanics also tells us that certain interactions between electrons involve more potential energy than others, but adding these details to our discussion won't help much. So we'll focus on the distance of the electrons from the nuclei for this video. So that's it. If we can separate the negatively charged electrons from the positively charged nuclei and hold them apart, we have a store of potential energy ready to go when we release them. Now, there's not really much we can do with atoms, but with molecules, there are lots of things we can do. And what determines where the electrons are in a molecule? It's time to talk about bonds. The idea of chemical bonds came about even before the existence of molecules had been accepted by the scientific community. Check out my video on the history of the Avogadro number for a brief introduction, but the concept of chemical bonds arose as a means of explaining how and why elements kept turning up in certain integer ratios in different chemicals and to explain the different properties of those chemicals. Organic chemistry in particular supported the concept of chemical bonds because it turned out that arranging atoms like this gives you a different chemical to when you arrange them like this. Can't see the difference? Don't worry, chemists need quite a lot of training to spot that difference and that's how important bonds are. From about the 1920s onwards, the lines that join atoms in molecular diagrams were understood to represent pairs of electrons that pulled nuclei together into a definite geometry. This theory of bonding is called valence bond theory, and it has the distinct advantage of being easy to visualize, and that's why schools typically teach only valence bond theory. At roughly the same time, however, another theory of bonding emerged called molecular orbital theory. In this idea, when atoms make molecules, the electrons are free to roam over the whole molecule in molecular orbitals. It's much more complex than valence bond theory, but it usually gives more accurate results for detailed calculations of molecular energy and geometry. Since computers have become so widespread and cheap, it's become the main theory for computational chemistry. So, if we have these two theories of how atoms make molecules, and we can switch between theories as we need, doesn't that mean that chemical bonds are just abstract concepts? No, because we can see them. Atomic force spectroscopy is an analytical technique that can see areas of high electron density in molecules. And guess where we see that density? Right where we said they would be using either valence bond theory or molecular orbital theory. So yes, our theories of how bonds work are abstract concepts with our line drawings and colored balloons, but we always knew those are abstract representations of something real. In other words, the bonds themselves are as real as atoms and molecules. And the reality of molecules was confirmed in 1921. So yes, bonds are real and they make a real difference to the energy of the molecule. Let's go back to our glucose example. Beta glucose, the molecule on the left, has a hydroxy group sticking out to the side. Alpha glucose, the one on the right, has that same hydroxy group sticking straight up. That small difference gives these two molecules a potential energy difference of about 12 kilojoules per mole. Now, that's not a lot, but it's enough for about a three minute walk. And it shows that it's not just which atoms are in the molecule, or even which atoms are stuck to which other atoms, but also their precise orientation to each other. Now, what is true is that the electrons are not bound tightly into little tubes like this. In fact, these lines are more like a map than a picture. A better representation is this one that shows where the electron density is. But even then, 
the majority of the electron density involved in chemical energy changes is between the nuclei right where those tubes are. So, does that mean the real energy in real molecules really is stored in the real bonds? Let's find out. But before we do, if you could just click the like button, it'll help me make more videos. Thanks. So let's begin by addressing the straw man that Derek Muller is so determinedly hacking to pieces. No one, especially not chemists, are suggesting that chemical bonds are sort of bags filled with energy and that we somehow get that energy out of them when we break bonds. Those lines that we draw do not have any independent existence apart from the molecule. But some of what Muller said was correct. Firstly, he rightly says that making chemical bonds from atoms results in a loss of potential energy. If we were to take a bunch of separate atoms and make them into molecules, the resulting molecules would have less potential energy than the separate atoms started with. Whether you imagine them losing the energy and then getting stuck in a molecule, or making their bonding orbitals first and then losing their energy, the final result is always the same. The atoms get stuck in a molecule because they have less energy than when they were separate. And now they don't have enough energy to get away from each other or to even change their arrangement. But, and this is the key point that Muller's missing, not all bonds lose the same amount of energy. In other words, after making molecules, some arrangements of atoms have still got more energy left than others. A classic example here is glucose and dioxygen. If we take six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and 18 oxygen atoms, we can make glucose and six molecules of dioxygen. And when that happens, those atoms will lose about 13,000 kilojoules per mole. In other words, making about this much Glucose and oxygen would give out enough energy to boil a bath of water or drive an electric car about 20 kilometers. So yes, those atoms have lost a lot of energy by making bonds. But if instead of making glucose and oxygen, we used those same atoms to make carbon dioxide and water, we'd lose over 50 15,000 kilojoules of energy per mole. In other words, we lose more energy by making carbon dioxide and water than we lose by making glucose and dioxygen. So, if we make our glucose and dioxygen from free atoms first, they'd have more energy than carbon dioxide and water because they've lost less energy than carbon dioxide and water lose. It's a bit like this box. On the top of this table, it has about two joules of gravitational potential energy. If I let it go, some of that potential kinetic energy will become real kinetic energy and it will move by itself down onto the chair. Now, on the chair, it has lost over a joule of that potential energy but it still has almost a joule of potential energy left. And as long as friction prevents it from sliding to the end of the chair, it will keep that potential energy stored. But if I add a little energy, move it to the edge of the chair and let it drop, the remaining potential kinetic energy becomes real kinetic energy and it moves again. Here on the floor, it has lost all of its gravitational potential energy and now it can't move by itself. So, if we can stop glucose and dioxygen from losing their energy and then, when we want to, turn them into carbon dioxide and water, glucose and oxygen will be an actual store of energy. So, what is keeping glucose and dioxygen from turning into carbon dioxide and water. 
That's right, the bonds. To rearrange these atoms into lower energy molecules, we first have to break these bonds and then make new ones. And if you've watched my video on activation energy, you'll know that can't just happen. We need to get activation energy from somewhere, just like we need energy to push this box off the chair. Until we get that activation energy from somewhere, the atoms will stay in this relatively high energy state. And that's why glucose is a store of energy and it's all down to those bonds. So bonds are responsible for storing the energy, but is it stored in the bonds? Very simply, if one arrangement of chemical bonds holds electrons further from the nuclei than other arrangements, then the electrons in those bonds will have more potential energy. And even if we put all the weird quantum mechanical bits of energy back in, we are still doing that with electrons in the bonding orbitals. The energy of electrons that are not involved in bonding do not change much, and the energy of the nuclei themselves don't change at all. So, what's responsible for the big energy difference between glucose and dioxygen versus carbon dioxide and water? The bonding electrons. And where are they? In the bonds. But of course, we almost never make molecules starting from atoms in chemistry. So where does the energy stored in glucose and oxygen really come from? Well, you know that from school. Plants use some extraordinarily complex molecular machinery to run the oxidation of glucose backwards. And they get the energy for powering that machinery from photons of sunlight. Where it is stored in the chemical bonds of glucose. And when we eat that glucose and oxidize it using the dioxygen that the plants also made, we get to use the energy that the molecules lose. That's 2,700 kilojoules per mole, which might not sound like much compared with the amount of energy emitted from making the molecules from atoms, but it's huge on the scale of living things. And that's because we get all our chemical energy starting from molecules, not atoms. And one mole of glucose releases enough energy to run a marathon. But having discussed all of that, what about molecules that have bonds that have nowhere left to fall, like carbon dioxide? Well, yes, it does not make much sense to say that carbon dioxide stores energy in its bonds. But then no one would say that carbon dioxide is a store of chemical energy. It's the chemistry equivalent of the box on the floor. So there we go. Most molecules do store energy in bonds. But at the end of the day, why should we care who thinks what about where the energy is stored? We all agree that it is stored somehow. Why not just say it's stored by the molecule and that it's all just an abstract concept? It's important because our theoretical models are how we visualize scientific phenomena and that controls how we think about them. If we get our model wrong or simply label a puzzle as an abstraction, we limit our ability to find new solutions and new paths to future discoveries. And even more importantly, if we don't have a good model in our heads, we get confused and end up being disillusioned about a subject that is actually perfectly understandable. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video, but I do want to emphasize that I'm a big fan of Derek Muller's Veritasium and particularly Nick Lucid's Science Asylum. I'm sure you've come across their channels before, but if you haven't, I've put links in the description, so be sure to check them out. And what do you think? How do you think molecules store energy?
Would you like to know more about how energy works in chemistry? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget that 326 is produced at Kyushu University. It's one of Japan's top universities and we have courses in science and engineering in English. And I'll see you next time.